So I like to spoke about all the sci-fi technology, right? And I will touch a little bit on the technology, right? On the sci-fi part. I like to start the presentation with, uh, with a slide, right? And in this slide, it's very interesting. If I will ask you a question, I want you to just think, just for one minute, think. Look at these six faces. Who do you think is the inside track? <laughs> right? No, no, there is a telltale sign. There is a science behind it. I want you guys to be the analyst. Right? Look at the clothes, look at the hairstyle, look at the eye, look at the makeup. There is a way to tell, seriously. Right? And there are research. Let me guide you a little bit. There is a research that is done by FBI on how they catch inside the track. Right? Um, there is a research done to understand their behavior. Some of us have some character. Some of your colleagues have some character. I can tell you what characters are more likely to be inside the track. If you see a colleague that has very high ego potential inside the track, you see someone that is very introvert, introvert meaning they don't talk a lot, they hide behind computer, they always keep quiet, very shy, you know, they don't talk to you, look at them, they don't like to look at you. Alright? Potential inside the track. So these are, these are some of the uh, telltale signs, the character. Now, I...
Now, on the DLB, as Alex has mentioned earlier, right, we are recognized by you know, uh, many analysts. Um, the more popular one being Gartner, of course. So if you look at Gartner, on 2017, we are again named the leader, right? But there are many leaders over there. There are some of you who like to come to me and say, hey, Brendan, you, your, your point is a little bit on the right, a bit on the left, a bit on the bottom, you know, the, the top on the magic quadrant. Right? So the, the position is, yeah, it's important. Right? But then again, the other thing to understand is that being in the market leader for nine years in a row, it's a different thing. If you are made a leader this year, it means you are a new leader. If you are made leader this year, then next year you got dropped out. That means you couldn't retain your leadership. To be able to be a leader nine years ago and maintain a leader for subsequent nine, nine years in a row without disconnecting, there must be a lot of consistency. There must be a lot of success story. All right? And Gartner will take in a lot of things. They don't just take in our vision. We can't just show them a few slides and they say, ah, I like your technology. That's a good way. They want to interview with customers. They want to understand how customers are using our solution. Right? And that is how we become a leader. Now, um, on 2016, we received the highest product score for regulatory compliance use case. A regulatory compliance use case means you use it for specific compliance. For example, PCI DSS. Right? You use it for a very specific compliance, for example, someone's Oxley. May or may not apply in, in, in time. But if you have an American company that operates here, then, then they have to comply as well. Now, the, the key thing here is, in our DLP system, there are many built-in policies. You can just click and select the compliance that you want, or the built-in policies that you want, and it actually shortens your time to deploy a DLP solution. Why do I make a point to highlight this? Now imagine if you can now do user behavioral analysis, and you combine compliance into user behavioral analysis. That means not only can I analyze what the user is doing, I can analyze what the user is doing in regards to PCI DSS data. Right? And naturally, it's very simple. Someone who copied 100 files is different from someone who copied 100 files containing all credit card data. The risk is just different. Right? And this is the possibility when you combine a UBA solution and a DLB solution. Now, I have a slide that talks about generally all the features of DLP. And it's not new, all right? We look at how we address data address, how we address data in motion, how we address on the endpoint. So these three is not new, all right? We are all familiar with this technology. You guys have some form of this technology installed in most cases. The part that is very interesting is actually on the cloud approach. In, in very recent months, or I'll say year, right? we have been talking with customers, and the challenges have been different. In the past, we were talking about how do I make sure that my user don't leak out confidential data out to the internet. Right? Now, it has been very different because they were asking me, they say, hey, Brendan, my data is not in my network. My data is already on one drive. How do I prevent a data that is outside from going to outside. You can't, you can't draw a parameter anymore. And in the past, if I want to share the data, what do you do? You attach the data, and then you send email attachment. Nowadays, when you want to share a file, you go to OneDrive, you create a share link, and you just send the link. My question to you, if you send the link over to a DLP system, can we inspect the content? Nothing. There is nothing yet, right, at that point in time. Right, so it's a completely different challenge. And for those of you who are adopting Office 365, think your SharePoint is going to be out there. Your Exchange is going to be out there. You will try to secure it. But you you find it very difficult to secure what is already out there. You cannot draw a line anymore. You cannot put gate. You cannot put a security guard. It's already outside. Right, so what are some of the solutions that we can do today? Now, we can look at file permissions. Right, that is one way. We can look at monitor uploads. What you upload to the OneDrive in the first place, right? Assuming it's not already in the OneDrive, right? Then the last part is you can discover files to do a audit. You crawl 
all than one drive in Office 365 and look for all files that contain uh, credit card information, customer information. All right, these are some of the things that we can do today with DLP. Now, um, Alex uh, mentioned about an acquisition of uh, Skyfax, a Casby uh, product. All right, that my colleague Dixon will talk about it in a short while. Pay a little bit of attention on Casby. CASB is going to be very exciting. CASB will probably be a must for any enterprise who have actually used um, cloud application for business. If you're using cloud application for personal, back at night, right? If you use your Gmail, it's okay, right? No problem. But if you use it for your actual enterprise, it's a different story, all right? Now, DLP secure sensitive data and use it. So the whole idea of DLP it's not to block files. Many people tell us, they say, cannot, cannot use DLP at night. All right? Once I use DLP, then my business cannot flow, cannot work. Then we tell them, no, the whole idea of DLP is actually to share. In the past, without DLP, you cannot share. Now with DLP, we want to promote sharing in a secure manner. For a simple example, if you look at human resources, sending personal data using Dropbox to an external recipient, a DLP can block, yes. But blocking is one of the very small features of DLP. What is more important is this. If human resources try to send personal data to a business partner using email, a DLP can automatically encrypt. All right, this is another example. If someone tries to copy a file into USB thumb drive, you can ask the person, are you sure you want to copy because it's sensitive? You, it's a reminder, it's a confirmation that they say, yes, I want. All right? Then they can actually help to confirm and they can encrypt and copy the number as well. So that's the correct idea of the DLP. Now, I want you to take a look at the default IP and compliance policies. Um, for those of you who have done some form of DLP, you will realize a big part of DLP revolves around data classification. You will have to spend very long time, very long hours to classify data, what data is confidential, what data is not confidential, right? You have to spend time on that. Now, in our case, we have all this built-in information, for example, you know, uh, what is a database file, what are files related to merging and acquisition, how do you look at credit card, what is some of the personal identifiable information, what are the suspicious user activity, and many more. All the different file types, Word, Power, uh, PowerPoint, Excel, everything, right? Network diagram, source code, right? All these things are all pre-configured for you. You just have to select the file you want to protect. You want to select the file that you think some of the confidential uh, data is in, right? And the system can automatically deploy and protect it. I'll give you a very simple example. If you look into PCI DSS or credit card, if you use a normal system, and I want you to create a rule, how do you look for credit card data? All right, some of you are from the banks, so you can tell me, hey, I don't easy. 16 digit start with four, Visa. 16 digit start with five, MasterCard. All right, look simple, right? But then, how do you know the 16 digit is not a bank account? How do you know the 16 digit is not anything else? My other question is, how do you look for uh, diners? How do you look for American Express? How do you look for, now very popular, Union Pay? All right? And then there are so many. Then you suddenly realize, ah, okay, credit card is not so simple. To create a rule for a credit card, you'll probably have to draft about 10, 20 lines. It must have 16 DG, it must start with this, it must start with that. In the case of our building classifier, we even do a modular function. Every four digit in your credit card, if you apply a modular function, will come to a checksum. Right? There is no such a loop check, we call it the evaluation and loop check. Right? So all these built in are very accurate to ensure no false positives. Now, what is very exciting is everybody uses the word analytics, big data analysis, analytics, and, and you use it everywhere. Everything also we want to analyze, right? Just now I started off analyzing the gearing, remember? Right? So the best part over here is we have a very new system that analyzes DLP incidents. Right? If you look into your firewall, you look into your IPS, you look into your D 
ERP system, how many events or how many warning or log generated in one day. I run around the Southeast Asian uh, region and I look at different industry and average incidents created on DLP per day is usually more than 1,000. Anyhow, it's more than 1,000. Now, my question to you, how big is your IT team? How big is your security team? How big is your incident management team? Right? If you only have one guy or two guys, these this people, I, I was meeting him, man, they will have to work very hard to go through 1,000 incidents. Right? If you have three or four, that's slightly better, but you still have to look at about three to four hundred incidents a day. And it doesn't scale. All right? That is why industry created a term. They call it security fatigue. Right? Fatigue means tired, security tired. Right? That's what it means. Now, the idea of incident analytics right, is to very quickly correlate all these DLP incidents and create a case so that you can look at the most important case on a day by day basis. If you look over here, the dashboard says there are four cases that exceed the risk score of 6.0. And they will tell you, you know, there are four cases with different scoring, suspected data theft. The classification accuracy is 85%. The possible of false positive is 14. There is over 1,000 social security number, there's a PII bridge. The total case size is 750 kilobyte. Right? They can help you to correlate 1,000 incidents to become four. Now, you can look into the files, customer records. You can look into the person. There is a photo showing you Chris orders from the accounting department. What is his phone number and his email address, for example? And if you click into it, it will bring you to the cases. Right? But more importantly, having all these incidents risk ranking will make your incident management a lot faster. You don't have to go through that 1,000. You want to work into this first. And it's very important because every case could be three incidents, or nine incidents, or two incidents, or maybe 100 repeated incidents. It's very similar to SIEM, if you can relate. You are supposed to correlate them, but not any people correlate. They use it just to collect them. So if you correlate it, and you correlate it very successfully, then you become an incident risk ranking. Now, um, the case can even tell you a story, right? so you can understand it better. You look into it, they say, Linda Jackson with a suspicious history. See, it's so smart that you even tell the history that he or she previously did the same problem. They have the same problem. With the same suspicious history, send PII contact more than 800 matches. Then it will tell you Linda Jackson with a suspicious history copied a database fingerprinted content, right? Over to a folder in the IP address, for example. Right? And, and this is how future security products should look like. If you have a product that tells you 1,000 incidents, I want you to think, how am I going to manage 1,000 incidents? It doesn't make sense. If you generate 2,000 incidents, it doesn't make sense. You need things that are actionable. You need things that you read, you can understand, and you can do something about it immediately. Right? Now, what about in real business environment when you implement a DLP? When you implement a DLP, a lot of time, I've I, I been involved in, in, in Thai tenders and RFP process, right? Yeah, together with my colleagues, you know, locally obviously. Um, and I, I've seen a pattern right, among Thai customers. When we select the vendor, we like to choose the feature. Who have the most feature, I will try to buy. Right? They bring two questions. Question number one, out of all these features, can you really use them all? Is this like, imagine if I were to choose Microsoft Word. I would choose Microsoft Word because Microsoft Word has 700 more features. I don't even know how many features they have, but there's so many that I don't even know how to use. Right? And I'm considered IT savvy. Now, what is more important that we felt, right, and, and, and we have the honor to have you know, my friends from uh, uh, the consultants to speak about this a little bit, right? We need to look into the people and the process. There are certain technology that blend into business process easier. There are certain technology that doesn't blend in that easily, right? Now, I want, I want to talk about routing incidents and incident management. When the 
there was an incident, how do you escalate it? Who do you assign it to? Do you escalate to the CISO? Do you send it to the, to the legal? How does it work? Now, in enforcement DLP solution, there is a workflow system. A workflow system means if you violate an incident, they can automatically send an email to the next person, maybe an incident manager. And the incident manager can manage the incidents without logging into the system. They can manage it directly from email. So on the email itself, they can select, do I want to release this quarantine? Do I want to assign this to another incident manager? Do I want to escalate this to HR? Or do I want to escalate it to legal? When you put in this type of system into you know, an enterprise, then you realize incident management becomes a lot faster. You don't have to train the people on how to use new tools. You don't need new people to log into the system to manage the LP. It becomes an email. It's just like receiving a normal email. Hey, your staff sent out sensitive data. What do you want to do? All right? And if you think about it in real DLP enterprise environment, there are two modes of management. There is those people who believe that everything should be managed by IT security team. There is also some very mature organization that believes you should empower the user. You should route the DLP incidents to the head of the department so that the head of the department can manage their own DLP incidents. For two reasons. Number one, you solve the problem on human resource. Remember the two little person on the IT team, right, that manage 1,000 incidents? Now you have six, you have 10, you have 20, because all the business head is responsible to take care of their data. The second part, how do you expect an IT guy to understand financial data? If IT guy were to look into a merging acquisition report, is it confidential? Is it not confidential? He cannot decide. But if you round it back to the data custodian, he can understand his own data very well. All right? And that is the true value of a workflow. Now, how do I extend this to cloud? All right? We have data discovery for Office 365. Right, so that you can go into cloud application and find out what are the sensitive data that my user have uploaded into, into Office 365 Cloud. These are some of the very simple functions that we can do. We can monitor file upload to OneDrive. We can monitor file sharing internal or external, right, on OneDrive as well. Um, and you know, we can stop that action. We can audit it, we can also delete those files. Now, the next part is to look into user behavioral analytics, right? The part that uh, you know, my colleague was mentioning about mission impossible and all. Um, the architecture for user behavioral analytics is very simple. How do you analyze behavior? You analyze behavior by the activity they do, by the action they perform. We will look into the application they launch, you look into their log on, log off time. You look into how many times they send email, how many times they read email, how many times they surf the internet, how many times they play a game, how many times they shut off the machine, how many times they hibernate the machine. And judging by all this information, you perform what we call a statistical analysis. All right? That means you look into the baseline. How often do you do this thing compared to other colleagues? If he do it more than other colleagues, then he is not normal. All right? I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm not saying he's an insider track. But he's risky. Just like the same guy that wear an earring. Because typically, the guy will wear it. Is anyone wearing it? Okay. That's good. Right? So I don't single you out. Right? So now in this case, I'm not saying he's definitely a bad guy, but he is a bit special. It's abnormal. All right? I will show you the dashboard of a command center. And this is originally military system used in defense, right? And they declassify it and they turned it into enterprise application. So it's very, very powerful. Now, in this system, you can see on my organizational risk score for the past 30 days, what is my risk? Red color meaning highest. You can also look into top daily risk today what are my top highest risk? And then, what are the riskiest people? The riskiest people over here is this guy called Jason Henderson. And why is he risky? He is risky because he started this program. 
He is risky because he tried to stop my DLP agent. He is risky because he tried to stop my antivirus also. When you do all these actions, the system can monitor your event, all right, and then give you a risk scoring. And if you look into Jason Henderson, they can tell you the timeline. All right, at nine o'clock, for example, at, at, at nine a.m., for example, he mounted nine drives. He started process. He viewed one email. He viewed one URL, and the URL fall under certain category that is risky. He tried to download the software, and the software is actually a password cracker, for example, right? Or a port scanner, for example. And then he tried to initiate four more files download. He tried to encrypt a file using an encryption software that is not provided by the company. All right. These are the small little things that you can do. And if you look over here, this is the risk scoring. The risk scoring is a comparison chart of his behavior against other colleagues. Right? If everybody log in only four times a day, why? Because you log in in the morning, you log in before you, after you go off for lunch, evening break, and then at night you're very hard working, so you log in one more time. But there's this guy who log in twenty times in a day. Why? Either he's very hard working, or he's inside the track. Not necessarily, right? But his risk scoring will be different. You get the idea. So the idea is to monitor the behavior of a person over a long period of time, and then compare his behavior with all the colleagues. What is the average of the whole company? Right? In the future, you can compare against his own department. For a salesperson, compare against sales department. For a HR person, compare against a HR person, and you can get all this kind of anomaly. Now, um, risk score activities on all the small little activities. There is also a video we play. If he do something that is very very funny, right? That is very dangerous. You can even start a video capture. For example, if you try to encrypt a file using a third-party encryption tool, you can start the video capture, all right? And the video capture can capture five minutes before and five minutes after. And that brings the question, right? How can you record an event five minutes before? Because I don't even know you're going to do something, right? But I start recording, all right? So the, the trick is very simple. It's like it's like your car DVR. It, it keeps on recording and you keep on deleting. When there is something that is interesting, you capture that and you save it. Does it make sense? All right. So you can always keep a five minutes before, five minutes after, for example. Now, you can have a video replay of what he does on his machine. Um, and by now, some of you will be talking to your friends. It's like, hey, I think this is a spy ring. Hey, I think Foxconn is trying to sell a tool that spy on people. <laughs> okay. So that is not the objective. Right? What I'm trying to say here is, all this thing is configurable. If you don't need video replay, don't do it. If you don't need to look into their keyboard strokes, don't do it. If you don't want to know when they reply email, when they reply email, don't do it. All right? Then you can look at general activity, what time they log in, how often they log in, and you can still create a baseline out of it. All right? Now, the SureView Insider Track is a proven effective scalable system, and it has been used by our parent company and some operated. Alright, so they have been using it for a very long time. It's just that very recently they have decided to declassify this and sell it you know, to the corporate world. Um, the last part of this is imagine. The insider tracks allows you to monitor the activity. The problem with a lot of UBA or UEBA solution, they are all monitoring activity, but they cannot see the data. The problem with DLP, they can only see the data, but they cannot see the human behavior. So what we are looking at is to join this together, where you can look into DLP incidents plus the human behavior and get a complete context and understanding of what your user is doing. Now, as of today, we already have an integration. The integration is very simple. If you have our DLP system and you have our UBA system, all the DLP incident that is high severity will send a trigger into the insider track and raise the risk scoring. So you can directly move the risk scoring up 
and you will appear as a top 10, top 15. You are the top 10 because you violated 20 DLP incidents. You are top 5 because you sent out email that contain a fingerprinted database, for example. And then combine you with other behavior, and that is a very accurate way of identifying what are the top inside the trends. Right? And with that, I end my session. Thank you very much.